Welcome to the Bible Forum. I'm Warren Sprouse. It's June 9th, 10th, 2018. And we're sitting here tonight in the Sunday Sermon segment. If you've got a Bible, I want you to open it up to Colossians chapter 1. I want you to look at verse 19. The Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, writes, For it pleased the Father that in him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, should all fullness dwell. Not just the fullness of deity, but the fullness. I don't think we really comprehend the concept. And having made peace through the blood of of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. All things. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Everything's been reconciled by that sacrifice. Oh, and you, that were sometime alienated, enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. And he has done this in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameable, holy and unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight. All of the Old Testament sacrifices pointed to this, a physical body. Blood shed was important. Why? Because God was going to do this with his only begotten son. Verse 23 if present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight, if all y'all continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, a gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister." This is Paul's concluding argument in chapter 1 of the concepts that he's laid out. And I want you to pay attention to the word for. The argument he's developing started in verse 10. He's making a case for believers to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. How? Being fruitful in every good work increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to God's glorious power, unto all patience and long-suffering, and with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which here he is speaking of God's grace, hath made us meet, that is qualified, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. To bolster his argument, Paul highlights the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 14, it is in, in him whom, <laughs> it is in Jesus that we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It is Jesus who is the image of the invisible God, not a physical image but an image of the invisible God, who is the firstborn of every creature, who is the creator and sustainer of all things in heaven, in earth, invisible, visible, who is the head of the body, the church, the firstborn from the dead. To what end? That he, Jesus, might have the preeminence. Why? Verse 19. Because it pleased the Father that in him, that is in Jesus, should all fullness dwell, and thereby reconcile all things unto himself. What seems to get lost in all this is the connection between what God has done for us in Christ, delivering us from the power of darkness, translating us into the kingdom of light, and what God expects from us now that he has reconciled us in the body of his flesh through death. Which is? Well, that we might be presented to God holy and unblameable and unreprovable. 
verse 23, if you continue in the faith, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and that you are not moved away from the hope of the gospel wherein you were saved. Now, this is not just theological icing on the redemptive cake. It's not even just a nice sentiment. It is a glorious goal. No. Paul is exposing the conditional nature of salvation. If we have redemption through Christ, then we will walk worthy of the Lord. If we have merely joined a church, said a prayer, then we will think we're saved. In the dark, quiet moments, we're likely to have some serious doubts. And both will color our mortal lives from that day forward. This little word, if, and what it represents shows up in every area of our life. Over the millennia, men have sought to make this an argument for the fact that believers can lose their salvation simply by not following through on their commitment. Well, nothing in the Bible teaches that principle, and certainly not this verse or collection of verses. This verse simply highlights the certainty of the believers following through on his commitment. If you are born again of the Spirit of God, you will follow through. And it teaches us that if there is no follow through, then there has been no reconciliation. There's no salvation. I shared with you earlier the story of a Baptist minister who told his people there was a time when you could see people in the pulpit say, well, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell. And he went on to say, well, that's insanity in many ways because that's not what Jesus even believes. That is outrageous, but it's not an isolated event. I mean, the theme varies, but it's being preached all over the country and around the world. The new Christian goes to church on Sunday and plays in a rock band on Saturday night. The new Christian drinks a little beer and is embarrassed when he lets a common vulgarity slip in the presence of someone he believes to be a serious Christian, perhaps his pastor. And I'm talking about people in leadership in the church. So let's look at what we now know. In verse 20, Paul says, Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross, reconciling all things unto himself. In verse 21, it says, We have been reconciled who were at one time alienated and enemies of God. We're not that anymore. Reconciliation has taken place. And verse 22 says, Thereby presented to the Father as holy presented to the Father as unblameable. No blame attaches to you. Presented to the Father as unreprovable. Nobody needs to come up, and not even God, and say, oh, it's not that way. you, you got to change and do this. And you say, oh, I, I'm not like that. I don't know any Christians that are. Well... <laughs> The text here does not indicate that this is the way you appear in the eyes of men, but rather in the sight of God. There's no disconnect between our salvation and our final presentation to God. He views us based on our commitment in salvation, that we repented of sin and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. At that moment in time, this thing was settled. If we have the first, we definitely will have the second. It's our inheritance, our hope. It's God's promise. Talking about heaven and the marvelous, sinless condition and state in which we will live forever. Well, what if we don't care to be holy 
and all the rest of it. Well, then clearly you're not saved. Well, and what if I just struggle in my effort to be holy? Well, now you're just seeking those things through your own strength. Well, what if I stumble? Well, you will be chastened of the Lord. You will be disciplined. He will get your attention if you belong to him. You see, the believer's commitment is from his heart, not from his head. Christianity is a package. It does not come a la carte. You can't have some parts of this Christian experience. Of course, today's brand of Christianity doesn't teach this. And this brand of Christianity today would have been rejected out of hand by the apostles and by every Christian up until the last 40 or 50 years. The idea that attending church services or putting bumper stickers on our cars or saying praise the Lord over everything is somehow all there is to being Christian is ludicrous. It's also heretical. The 21st century has ended up with a religious straw man, an apostate form of Christianity, one that allows our young people almost unbridled access to the profane culture and still be Christians, one that limits only the most vile behaviors from our own experience, one that brings worldliness into the church, calling it outreach, one that sees no limitations, whether it's alcohol, drugs, sex, unequal yokes, divorce, abortion, foul mouth language, or worse, homosexuality, transgenderism, and all of that. All these and more are sanctioned by the God of the 21st century Christian. You see, that God understands that we're just human. And that we, well, we're just being gentle, judgmental. And of course, he's not. But the God of this age, the God of this sort of Christian is not the God in heaven. The leadership of this form of Christianity is weak. Much of it is corrupt. More than one big name preacher has in their elder years denied the carnal doctrine of salvation, declaring that they now believe all men will be saved, denying the existence of an eternal hell. In their younger years, we're learning just how loose some of these men were. And in the pews, the evangelical church is now rife with divorced members and leaders. The last statistic I read on the subject indicated that as a segment of 21st century American society, the evangelical community had a higher rate of divorce than the general public. Only their pastors divorced at a rate higher than they do. As time goes on, more and more evangelical preachers are accepting of abortion, drugs to control emotions, techniques to acquire spiritual blessings, and even homosexuality, and now transgenderism. And among those who do not accept these things, the majority refuse to speak out against those who do. They call it love. I call it complicity. Why are we so surprised when our young people growing up in this spiritual weakened form of Christianity reject the holy standards of God in favor of what the world has to offer. Whether it's fashions or attitudes or literature, media, music, toys, parties, alcohol, drugs, you name it, sex. Well, the answer is it's all they see and hear, even in their homes, through the various forms of media that parents allow them. We take them to church once or twice a week, teach them the Bible stories, encourage them to pray and trust Christ. But we don't always live it out in front of them. We get angry and the words come out. And children are idealists. Okay, you know, they write you off and your faith. After 15 years of this, they opt for what the world offers. At least it's honest. Nobody out there is to pretending that they're anything other than what they are, like you. 
What happened? Well, humanly, they never saw Christianity or the Bible working in the way it should. They never saw Christian parents being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which, speaking of God's grace, hath made us meet, that is, qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. They rarely saw Christian pastors or deacons or Sunday school teachers being fruitful either. And the ones they did see were exceptions. They saw people who were too busy, too self-centered to stay home and be the anchor and the rudder that they needed, holding them accountable. Consequently, they had to accept more responsibility for their life than they were really capable of. They saw only that going to church was important, not actually being a Christian. And they were being educated by the government, all the while entertained with perversions of reality, encouraged to rebel against authority, treated like adults, even when they were really children. You see, young people learn at a very early age that they are special. And that old people are just fools, living out their boring lives, waiting to die. In the face of all this, the world sees Christianity as a complete failure. A Christianity that can't produce what it professes. Did God set all this up that it could fail? Or that it would fail? No. Verse 19, before the beginning, God decided that everything, things on earth, things in heaven, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, magistrates, powers, all things would find their resolution in Jesus. The use of the word fullness is deliberate. Paul could have worded this principle in any number of ways. This one's a shot across the bow of the Gnostics, the people who say, You can't know. Gnosticism that teaches all physical matter is evil. Therefore, a holy God could not have created it. Apparently, according to their wisdom, God created spirit beings they call emanations, who then created everything we see. The rest of us say, you got a verse for that? The accumulation of divine powers and attributes which they believe were divided among the various emanations they call the fullness. Paul makes it clear that whatever they thought the fullness to be, it is wrapped up in Jesus. Do you hear that? Jesus is the fullness. It's deliberate. In chapter 2, down in verse 10, later on, he says, And you, the Christian, are complete in him. Back in chapter 1, God's purpose was to gather all things into Christ, Paul said, that in all things he, Jesus, might have the preeminence. And there is a sequence that is established. Paul alludes to it, it lays it out. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. First fruits, he's the pattern of all that will come afterwards. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. And then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all the things under himself. 
And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. It's a grand structure. And it's been God's purpose from the very beginning. This is what the creation of this world has been all about. And this is coming with the final judgment by a God who cannot sin, by a God who cannot do anything that's not absolutely holy. I want you to understand that somebody's due for a great shock and it's going to happen at the great white throne in heaven. When the dead, small and great, stand before the Lord of glory, the judge, and they are judged based on the works they have done. I believe they want that. They insist on that. Look at all of them. And it happens. But the picture we're given is of this judge, which is Jesus, whom they have rejected. Irony. This judge turns, and there's another book, the Lamb's Book of Life. If your name's not written there, really doesn't matter what you did. And everybody who stands before that judge at the great white throne is going into hell. Eternal damnation. And that, my friends, will be a shock. Where will you be at the great white throne? Will you be standing with the judge in a ray behind? Or will you be judged by him? Better to be judged now and to make the judgment that matters and to repent of your sin and to believe from your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll save you. He'll seal you. He'll equip you. He'll empower you with the Holy Spirit and set you out to do marvelous things, which you probably won't do because you're human and you don't get it. Pretty much takes a lifetime to understand. And then you die. Sometimes I think the, uh, the reason we disdain our older people, the elders in our family, is because they know too much. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, that's it. That's it for tonight. We'll see you next week. Take care.